Women Abroad. I am Dr. Mohamud Rabiul Halim. Welcome you all on behalf of Planetary Health Academia. Our today's topic is spinal cord injury in emergency department. Today we have with us Dr. Linik Roles Hardar, consultant emergency medicine, Queen's Hospital London, along with five renowned experts in the relevant field. So without further delay, may I invite Dr. Linik to start the proceedings. Um, thank you very much uh, for this humble introduction. So today, um, we'll try to be very crisp and mainly try to focus on the practical aspect of uh, C-spine slash cord injury uh, that we see on emergency department. Um, so the question is, uh, why this is important? So the, the, there are many reasons, there are lots of studies, but these are often missed, number one. Number two is sometimes it's difficult to diagnose. Number three is a significant delay in diagnosis. So for that reason, we should be careful in polytrauma patient, or even a patient, we don't suspect any trauma, uh, that is a C-spine, is, is a spine is a problem, and then is a cord is a problem. So we have to think about that and then consider about that. So I'm coming to these slides in a minute. So, what triggered this actually uh, today, Dr. Uh, Mustak Chaudhary is supposed to present this case, but I want to present something which is quite interesting. So we had three elderly trauma patient in one month uh, who presented, all of them presented late. Uh, one I think presented after uh, more than 72 hours even. Uh, and all of them had significant spinal injury, uh, at least radiologically. Uh, but the delayed presentation or one missed. So one of our, uh, two of our doctors just uh, write it up and uh, published in one of the European journals. So I'm just presenting one case from there and we're breaking it up slowly and progressing that the new things or the things we do here, the aim of this platform is to bring the Western uh, medicine or what we're doing the practice to infuse slowly to Bangladesh. So, it was a 92-year-old gentleman um, who had a fall the night before he arrived to ED. Uh, his daughter came to see him and they found some bruise on the forehead and tracking uh, periorbital um, bruising. So brought him down by, his, by her own car to be checked. And on examination, so in the past medical history-wise, he got lots of comorbidities, but independent enough to leave alone. Um, according to him, he had some retrograde amnesia. Uh, according to the NICE 176 guideline that requires CT head. Now, on examination, he has some minimum midline C spine tenderness, very minimal. So, in the chat box, if someone can say imaging point of view or treatment point of view, what do you want to do now? Do you think you should do something? So, an elderly gentleman, 92 year old, had a fall. And now examination wise, some midland tendon is 92 years of age. What do you want to do for him? Anyone just type a few things or you can speak up if you like. Maybe it's too complicated, shall I proceed probably? Okay, just think something what you do, but let's see what we have done. So of course we tried to see spine immobilization and as a part of the protocol, we did a CT head and C spine scan. And now that's the C spine looks like. So can you see any abnormality in the C spine CT? We need a CT straight away. So someone said extra C spine and CT spine. Okay, good choice. And you did C spine, the C spine is here. Uh, anything you can see, maybe in the upper part of the cervical spine. I know it's, it's, it's a CT, but I give you one slice, it doesn't help. Anything? So if you see the upper part, um, C2 vertebra, the peg, I'm not sure if I can, can you see my laser pointer? Can you see my yes. laser pointer? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so that's that's the peg odontoid. Um, it's not, 
the way it should be. That patient came after 24 hours uh, time. Then this is the lateral view and look at the same fracture, but look at it here, right? Um, so what to do? So of course, is a, there's no neurology for this patient, uh, luckily. So we contacted uh, neurosurgeons and we put in a soft collar and they said because of the age and frailty or given no neurology, we are not doing anything, uh, we admit under medical. Thing happened and is or maybe another old person the the fate could be different so it, it's very difficult to predict so i'm just taking you to the c spine injury and consecutive um, um, spinal cord injuries along with it so how we actually practice and what happened so before we go forward about elderly patient so because of their osteoarthritis and the limited movement and the structure of the dance, they're very, very prone. And in England, we have a data called a TRAM, TRAM data, Trauma Audit and Research Network data. So any patient above 65, so don't ask what is 65, it was a, um, a retirement age, so the study went like that, now retirement age is 68. It could be now like 68, but some part of the country has um, the frailty age is different. So up north slightly younger, um, some part of the country, even eight years they consider frail. So most of the common um, injuries and um, uh, severe injuries in elderly happen from standing position. And the term silver trauma about the frail elderly patient trauma, we talk about silver trauma. Do you use this? Um, do you use this um, term in Bangladesh? That's the question I want to ask. Actually, not. No. So, I'm so sorry. I'm a bit troubled with my pointer. <laughs> uh, let me just get rid of it. Right. Right, so this is something to uh, think about and talk about. Do we use ISS scoring, injury severity score in Bangladesh? So I think Kanes Fatima in IT, do you use that or? Uh, no, unfortunately we don't use it. Sure, so that was the things and the small things I was trying to bring up that what we use it here and um, what we can introduce in Bangladesh. Like we started news scoring system in few hospitals in Bangladesh, including my college, Solimula Medi Medical College. So this is something is a worldwide accepted and people understand each other's language, what you're talking about. So if uh, all of you just keep the point about these two things is ISS and silver trauma, lots of literature and you can go to the national website in, in England or I'm pretty sure Americans have some sort of standard of course, there is some standard, but I'm talking about, as you said, protocol that we can use for our trauma patient. So the question is, lots of patients will come. So we, we see like 500 odd patients per day, and it's quite a big center. We are a major neuro trauma center as well. Now, thousands of patients we are seeing weeks. Now, we're not scanning everyone. We are not considering spinal cord injury in everyone. We are not you know, but we're doing some and why and when to consider spinal cord injury. So there are a few things. Look at the terminology here, it's consider, right? So any major trauma, we think we to consider because it's part of it. Minor trauma with spinal pain, without neurological signs of symptoms or with neurological signs of symptoms, we definitely consider that. Any altered consciousness, definitely. And the mechanism of injury is important and pre-existing spinal disease is also very important. Now, if you see the most of the spine actually either very strong or fixed with other structure, like the whole thoracic spine fixed with um, rib cages. But if you see the junction, which is lower cervical and um, thoracic, and again, thoracolumbar junction is common, but C-spine is not protected. So any part of it is very, very, vulnerable and it's, it's just not right. Now, anyone in the emergency department, if they're not coming by uh, ambulance service 
um, we need to, if we, think, if we consider is a, um, this is a spinal injury, either bony or cord, whatever, we need to immobilize the patient. We start with manual immobilization. Can anyone identify, oh, by the way, if you have any images that not referenced there, this is from Royal College of Emergency Medicine UK website. So just to clarify that, this is not from any website. This is our college website. So if you see these two patients uh, in neck immobilization, can you spot the difference and which one you would prefer? Or both are correct. Actually, can I bring Daryl here? Daryl, would you mind to just tell us a few things about this immobilization? Because it's so vital, because this is the first thing we consider that first, let's save it. Thanks, Lunik. Um, yeah, I think when we suspect uh, an active spinal cord injury, at that point, it is quite important to immobilize. I think we should also bear in mind that when someone does fracture their C-spine particularly, but any spinal uh, vertebra, there's a, there's a lot of pain. And often these patients actually protect their own C-spines. They won't move it around. I think the risk factor is usually that unconscious patient or the patient who's intoxicated, who might be flailing around with a C-spine injury. But when we suspect it, the, the key here is to minimize movement because especially if they are still moving their limbs and they don't have a actual neurological deficit and if we've identified a, uh, or suspect a c-spine injury we want to prevent that from happening and to do that we really got to use almost three points in protecting the c-spine so you look at the left and the right there are differences i'll leave that to the audience to try and work out to maybe comment in the chat um, but you really need to be careful because if you, if you, the person immobilizing the C-spine, for example, is talking to someone else or needs to grab something and moves their body to either left or right, the head will probably go with that with them without them actually realizing. So you need something that really pivots and uh, prevents pivoting and then has full immobilization with the rest of their body. The risky area is obviously the thoracocervical area. Um, as Lunik has said earlier, uh, that's uh, a weak point uh, with the mobility of your spine. So I'm not going to give you the answer, um, but I think someone has already uh, said uh, the right one. And if you have a look there, there's immobilization onto the trapezius muscle and also the the sort of wrist part of the hand and arm is immobilizing the, the neck and the head. And that's to stop movement around that point. In the first one, the one on the left, you can see if that uh, person immobilizing the C-spine moved, then you, what you would see there is the head moving as well, which we don't want to do. Thanks, Lenny. Thank you so much. So you see the difference in the holding the trapezius on the side. So this is a very practical thing that we do it day in, day out, and bad things happen. Now, then someone is holding it. The second person, we, if we consider, we're considering C-spine, so second person need to get a collar. And how to measure collar, you can just go to YouTube, but how to measure, I just got some diagram here. And um, of course, uh, you can take from there. Do you have a C-spine collar in our public hospitals in Bangladesh? Supply or if you consider C-spine injury, do you have that facilities or? Yes, yes, collar available. Everywhere. Okay, fantastic. So you know how to measure and so the gold standard is three-point immobilization and a cervical collar and blocks on both sides and you are taping that. Right now, do you do that in Bangladesh? This is a common practice. Any suspected C spine injury? Yes, we do. In, I cannot uh, see the chat, but uh, yes, we usually use uh, C collar okay. and other immobilization technique from our ear department to ICU. Right. Right. So just looking at. Um, 
the C-spine injury prevalence uh, in alert patient and those who cannot communicate because of intoxication and conscious sleeping um, there. So alert patient actually has less um, or uh, the unconscious patient or with the patient we cannot evaluate, they have more C-spine injury. So that will be very, very considerate that who are under influence of alcohol or low GCS, unless otherwise, is a very high number uh, that they are having a C-spine injury. Now, C-spine immobilization is actually not benign, especially in elderly. Uh, it happens even in our hospitals and every hospital, I believe, because patient is going to scan and in a, or patient is put on a collar and block in a, in a trauma board and waiting for hours, maybe not hours, but minutes that go to the CT scanner or there is a queue in CT scanner or coming back, there is a lack of people to put him out of the, the scoop. So there's lots of things happen. And that of course, you see what are the major complications of C-spine immobilization can happen. Now in pediatrics, we stopped using the C-spine immobilization according to the ATLS and we don't use it either, but also in elderly, right? There are reported cases this is from Royal College, that people trying to make straighten the neck and unfortunately something happened that you can see. Now, I go back to this patient, that our patient. So look at the spine. How do you feel about the curvature of the spine? Can you see the curvature? You know, do you, if you want to straighten this, straighten this neck, what would happen? And actually this patient had a collar. You yeah. can see the collar, but fortunately or unfortunately, the collar is not rightly applied. Probably it's intentional to, to just patient is blocked and making sure that radiographer don't cause any trouble. So loosely just put a collar just to make sure. But this is an example, like if you want to stay a leg like that, the outcome may not be good. Yeah. Yes. So example. So, Gold standard is not always gold standard. So ideally in elderly patient, we don't put collar and because it's very difficult and, and not comfortable. And we can make the neutral, natural position for them. And we do two point, which is a block and tape only. Right. So does all the patients requiring imaging? That's the question now. As I said, we have hundreds of thousands of patients coming per week. Um, will you scan all of them like who had neck injury or C-spine pain? So to rule it out, so there are few uh, school of um, thought or tools we have. Uh, one is Nexus developed in America is a prospective study. It's a massive 34, 35,000 patients been involved in this case, uh, in this study. And the mnemonic is NSAI, AI, NSAI, it's like ibuprofen and NSAI. So what you look for, is any neuro deficit there? Uh, is there any spinal tendon? Is there any asymmetry or focal neurology there? Or loss of consciousness, I mean, reduced consciousness, intoxication there, or destructive injury there? If something there, you need x-ray, right? Do you, and so let me just finish the second part. Another thing is Canadian C-spine group, which is similar, but it, brings the age and the mechanism of injury. So the question is here, do you use any tools, any of them in Bangladesh to evaluate C-spine injury? Anyone from? Actually, not established any specific protocol, but we uh, mostly depends upon the history and mode of injury and initial evaluation, clinical evaluation, and uh, Im immediate uh, radiological evaluation. So all the uh, things is guided us to detect whether any spinal injury or not. So this is the question here. The, the reason I brought up here, because whether you'll do a scan or not scan, and that, I mean, extra plain radiograph, in young patient or th th that we determined by these two in, in, in England at least. And of course, America and Canada got the same standard. So previously initially Americans uh, developed Nexus by Canadian 
uh, six months. So for all the students, if you just um, go back and search about these two terminology and how does it work, the lots of lots of nice videos and YouTube and their website is very nice. So, so it's quite funny. So American made Nexus and then Canadian made Canadian C span rule and Canadian did not did a quite big study and, and they said Canadian uh, C span rule is superior. Uh, but actually they are superior in a sense because uh, some added um, benefit of mechanism and the age content there. So NICE, which is um, UK guidelines in 16, we started using Canadian C-spine. But you know what, at the end of the day, as you mentioned, our moderator mentioned that, uh, what do you feel? But there is a medical legal perspective. There is a indication you always use and at the end of the day, clinical judgment is clinical judgment. So try to use these tools um, to make yourself uh, buy the diagnosis or increase your suspicion or ability. The question is, uh, as you mentioned, um, uh, that whether will you do X-ray or a CT or an MRI. So if you do spinal X-ray, uh, we normally have three standard view. I believe Bangladesh is the same thing. We do lateral view and AP view and odontoid peg view. This is a normal scan. The question is here in the past, um, there are two other views quite um, popular. And do you use these views at all at the moment? Uh, or what view do you use in Bangladesh to see C spine injury if you do an x ray? Anyone can speak up other if you? You know, typing maybe a bit complex. Anyone can talk. AP view and lateral view is commonly practiced. Um, mm -hmm. So, AP view and lateral, you don't do odontoid peg view? Yeah, odontoid also, but not uh, flexion or extension view. Okay, okay, good. Because this is this is no point. Um, the reason I'm mentioning that, because we don't do any of those, but I'm thinking about Bangladeshi context, maybe someone who is in. A district hospital there's no advantage or facilities of city in nearest vicinity then what you do so no point in flexion extension view and similarly you can do but it's very difficult no point doing those so if we do plain radiograph it's a massive 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 study uh, plain radiograph we miss some sort of uh, fractures now most of them because of inadequate film and we were confident or clinically it's not those things in the inadequate we just rule it out or sometimes even the x-ray is normal there could be injuries but but still just i mean extra c span in practice in uk uh, but there's some certain point above age 65 or mechanism or other injuries we do not do extra we just go for pan city but just to mention you cannot rely on extend 100% if you're clinically suspicious. Let's talk about CT scan. So this is our gold standard. But if it's, a, if it's something that you're, you're not sure that it's unlikely to be any spinal injury or spinal cord injury, a CT spine, a C spine only, will give 14, 14 times more radiation to thyroid gland. And we have to be careful about it. And of course, it's gold standard. But sometimes, even extra normal, CT normal, still patient have pain or symptoms. And then we need MRI and that can pick up injuries. And I have patients like that and I have experience with that. So this is the indication of MRI. If it's a neurological um, signs or severe pain that you cannot um, rule out and that can pick up human injuries or discarnation or hemorrhage. I do not recommend MRI in a routine C-spine scan. So any C-spine injury, you have to understand it's a part of trauma. Other uh, injuries uh, coexist. So a proper ATLS uh, should be run and a 2 assessment should need to be done. Another scan, E-fast or pan trauma should require. And um, on top of that, as I said, the spinal injury often miss. Lots of loss of medical legal case that we missed uh, spinal shock or transection of the spinal cord or incomplete spinal injury, spinal cord injury, it, it came up later in the ward. So the golden hours been missed. So 
you do your trauma, you run your trauma, that spinal examination is important, uh, log road is important, a power rectal examination is important. It doesn't matter you do it before the scan or after the scan, depending on the situation, because radiology will not tell you everything. So when you examine, there's another thing, another tools that we use is American Spinal Injury Association chart, right? So that looks like that. So if we just keep this American Spinal Injury Association chart, and that so nicely explain all this level. And if you put your examination findings here, then you can find out whether is it a complete or incomplete uh, spinal cord injury and what level is this? Because it, in one page is nicely done. I would suggest if you don't have this in your hospital, you can just open so you can go to their website, ASEA website, and um, then uh, you can copy and then use it for your assessment. It's got very, very nice tool. So I'm just trying to give you uh, the tools, the protocols, the charts that we use here. It's very simple that can be easily uh, done or the practice can be started in Bangladesh. Uh, to, but but it, it saves a lot of things, a lot of morbidity as well. So you have different incomplete um, cord injuries, you can, I'm pretty sure all of you know, or if not, just take a screenshot and uh, look in the book, uh, because you have expert, they need to talk and give their advice and question. So another question I want to uh, raise here, um, the spinal shock and neurological shock. Uh, in trauma, we have lots of shocks, hypovolemic shock, uh, it could be obstructive shock, um, could be distributed, distributed, yeah, could be for secondary reason, but but some two other shocks, uh, I'll probably leave it for discussion uh, or our respectable panel can explain that or you can ask any question, uh, but we need to clarify this, very important. So that's it. Um, anyone has any question on any part of it? Uh, so, Lilik, you mostly uh, highlighted us about the early recognition and early assessment. You emphasis on mostly, but uh, we have uh, on the side by side. We want to know about the early resuscitation strategies. What should we do? The uh, other than ABC of resuscitation, any specific early measure regarding uh, spinal cord injury that can uh, maybe. Uh, beneficial and probable good outcome. Sure. I got a feeling, have I shown you this slide that went to consider spinal cord injury? Yes, yes, you have already. Have you, have you, have you seen that? Yes, yes. And when to suspect? Uh, no, you did not show it. Sorry, I just escaped. So I just want, I'm just going back here, apology for that. It's my computer. So I, we said earlier, when we consider spinal cord injury and when we suspect spinal cord injury, right? So if you have a spinal cord injury, the, the below the injury point, we have flaccid paralysis. And of course, decrease in tone and the breathing because the diaphragm is diaphragmatic breathing and extra, extra, um, extra, Ex accessory muscles been not used. Elbow flexion extension is the issue, so they cannot um, extend. And hypotension and bradycardia and PRP some so the things. So you mentioned about, so just to clarify that. So you mentioned about, the question is, how do you resuscitate this patient, right? Yes. <clears throat> so first thing is, so if you see the trauma protocol is A to E assessment. And A means airway and cervical scan protection. So first is manual immobilization followed by three-point immobilization. And we need an early, early diagnosis, early scan. And of course we have documented neurology. If you can primary survey, we cannot do the pinpoint neurology to see what is the injury. But as soon as the scan happened, or the scan is delayed, we can straight into the secondary survey, followed by a log roll and any signs in the spine and PR at the same time. Now, spinal management point of view, like 
uh, I don't want to actually speak about the shock now. Uh, probably I'll ask the faculty or Daryl to explain that. Immobilization, flat in bed, we use our uh, flat bed or uh, Wolverton mattress or scoop just to make sure the whole spine not removed and two point slash three point immobilization to protect that. And as I said, the, is this a trauma comes as a trauma, we have other injuries. So a every point of view, any B issues, any C issues, any D issues, we, we go by that. Now, if you have a someone with intracranial injury, there's a special thing that, you know, how we take care of this patient. I think Ganesh Fatima can tell us that nursing in 30 degree and um, PCO2 level, PO2 level, and how tight that we should not use the collar at that point. So this is c spine point of view. But RVS point of view, when you have a spinal injury, immobilization, point of diagnosis, where is the injury, the neurosurgical involvement, is emergency point of view is a, is, a, is a thing to do. Because we are not someone who can fix it. And in spinal injury, what so suppose if it's a lung injury, then subpulmonary hemorrhage or pneumothorax or pericardial tamponade or pericardial condition or interdominal bit, we can we, we are the diagnostic, early diagnostic, and we can resuscitate those patients with fluid and other things. In spinal shock, yes, we initially, um, in neurological shock, we initially give some fluid to make sure there's no hypovolemia uh, followed by anotrope support. But the main point of spinal injury, the way we manage is immobilization, making sure not to make it worse by trying to do the immobilization and early diagnostic and early referral. That's, that's the key. Now, do you have any particular question in particular point or Daryl, do you want to add something uh, in that point of view? Yeah, thank you, Lunik. I think um, Dr. Lim, um, just to answer your question, how do we resuscitate these patients? Um, on the first instance, these are trauma patients. So just you got two types that come in when it comes to assessing spinal cord injury. One are the alert patient, and the other is the unconscious patient or one with a low GCS that can't really give you sort of reliable information. So with the alert patient, you can probably get a sense of spinal cord injury pretty early um, when you're asking and you're doing a quick, what we do, a screening neurological assessment um, during the secondary survey where you're looking at a bit of motor function and sensory function in both limbs and um you can if there's a deficit below a certain level you sort of know what you're dealing with the unconscious patient is the really tricky one because they won't be moving their limbs they won't be following commands and in the trauma context the patient who is in shock uh who is unconscious i think we all really need to focus on we need to resuscitate this patient as though they a general trauma patient first we have to exclude that there aren't any signs of hemorrhage or potential hemorrhagic sites such as intra-abdominal bleeding intrathoracic bleeding and intrapelvic bleeding you know the standard treatment for us is to part of damage control resuscitation in these patients is one to stop the bleeding wherever you can and that might require a uh, surgeon's intervention in the abdomen, in the pelvis, you might need interventional radiology or orthopedics, or simply just to close the pelvis with a, um, uh, a strapping. Uh, we use something called pelvic grips, which help, but to stop the bleeding and then to resuscitate. Uh, usually, now it's easy for us to say in London, we do it with blood products. Um, but having worked in, in remote areas myself, sometimes you don't have that, and that would require some fluid at least into resuscitation <laughs> before you can get blood products. So that's the basis. When, when you don't find these uh, uh, hemorrhage sites or other reasons for the patient being in shock and they're unconscious, or if they're conscious and you suspect a spinal injury and you have the patient having a persistently low mean arterial pressure which is just a calculation with your systolic and diastolic blood pressures if they've got a persistently low mean arterial pressure we start thinking could this be neurogenic shock 
Uh, and for just for the audience, neurogenic shock is not spinal shock. Neurogenic shock is what it says. If you have a high thoracic or um, cervical spine injury, the um, sympathetic nerve chain at that level is cut off and you don't get um, innovation to the vasculature, meaning you don't get the ability for the patient to vasoconstrict during, during shock. So that means they vasodilate and often below the lesion, you'll feel that the patient is warm and above the lesion that the patient is probably cold. And in that case, um, you start thinking, how are we going to keep this patient's blood pressure at a reasonable level um, to maintain perfusion? Because everything about resuscitation is about perfusion and perfusion of organs. Um, fluids certainly help in, in neurogenic shock uh, to, a, to a, a smaller or lesser degree. Um, and we've got our ITU specialists here who can who will receive these patients and actually have to manipulate the fluid. And then also um, vasopressors, which might be needed just to support that vascular tone. Um, so it is a difficult one because in the polytrauma patient, you don't know what kind of shock you're dealing with. Um, if there is a neurogenic component to it. But often in my experience, it's a patient who's unusually bradycardic despite being in shock. Uh, you know, they, they're quite warm um, below the level of injury where they should be shut down and, and cold and clammy. Um, and also they're not responding to your resuscitative measures like blood particularly or any other um, uh, 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 fluids that you might use so that's what we would do I think the take-home message though is always resuscitate your patient first doesn't matter what the cause of the shock is and then if you're not if the patient's not responding to adequate resuscitation uh, then you might be thinking is this a spinal injury in the alert patient it's pretty straightforward I mean our IT colleagues can comment thank you thank you Daryl I have some comments in our center, we have a definite trauma court system and trauma team. Whenever a patient uh, transfer from uh, emergency department to ICU, so we have side by side assess the patient and resuscitation is doing the side by side. But sometimes, especially uh, in the road traffic accident, in case of motorbike accidents and other accidents, so there is a uh, some. Uh, head injury, maxillofacial injury, cervical injury, both side by side is very common. So sometimes uh, after resuscitation, initial stabilization of hemodynamics, we have to, we have to do uh, decompressive craniotomy for the uh, traumatic brain injury uh, to reduce intracranial pressure. But the question is, uh, sometimes we uh, take some time to do some uh, maxillofacial stabilization and other things, but my question is, in that case, if any cervical injury or any uh, vertebral uh, instability, is it uh, more, uh, how rapid it required to uh, intervene in compared to uh, like decompressive craniotomy? Is it uh, very urgently needed for uh, cervical surgeries or other interventional procedures like uh, decompressive craniotomy? This is my question. Another question. Or we can wait some uh, times for do such type of surgery. So, Dr. Can, shall I take it? Uh, Dr. Hassan wants to come in. Hi. So, Sorry, do I say Fazil Hassan, one of the spine neurosurgeon? Oh, no, Fazil, yes. We have a right uh, person. <laughs> now, it is a very tricky question. I don't do any cranial surgery anymore, purely a spine, but during my training, I don't know, Kausar is joined us not. Kausar? Uh, he has not joined probably. So anyway, so it is a very tricky, uh, tricky uh, question because if the ICP is going high, you cannot wait to stabilize the cervical spine first and then to do a decompressive craniectomy. Decompressive craniectomy is a life-saving emergency surgery. Okay, so, and you have to have a discuss with the patient that despite your unstable uh, CS spine injury, 
whether if it's a bifrontal uh, decrepit craniectomy, we don't have to move the neck, so it's fine. But if you have to do a temporal uh, occipital uh, craniectomy, yeah, then you have to move the neck. So that is a very tricky, uh, tricky uh, position. Sometimes we used to do that, you know, when you put into the Mayfield head clamp and try to tilt the table as much as possible so that you can try to get it without moving the neck, you would get some form of a lateral position. Okay. And other something that if you have to speak with the family because the patient would be unconscious that this is the chances you have to take this saving procedure. We cannot wait to fix a neck to do a decompressive craniac craniectomy. You have to apply your adjustment and to see the decompressive craniectomy can be avoided or cannot be avoided with medical measures of reducing the ICP. It is purely adjustment. You, you allude to a problem we all have is when you have a traumatic brain injury in mm. association with major trauma or in this mm. case, spinal cord mm. injury with neurogenic shock because the world is moving away from over-resuscitating in the early phase to what we call, I, I prefer saying smart resuscitation, but permissive hypotension or, you know, it just essential resuscitation measures to keep your MAP just above the 65, 70, just to perfuse, which reduces the risk of bleeding. However, so the same would apply to neurogenic shock is you would want to keep that mean arterial pressure up. When we have traumatic brain injury in, in sort of running parallel at the same time in the same patient, we want to have better um, uh, perfusion of the brain because intracranial pressure is going up with a brain injury. So you might need a higher MAP. And this is a tricky one. I don't think uh, the, the literature is still you know, out there on what we should do exactly. But I think in practice, we try and push the blood pressure, if possible, a little bit higher. We, our target endpoints would be probably a little bit higher to perfuse the brain so that your cerebral perfusion is taking place. Yeah. But that's traumatic brain injury and polytrauma is, is a really difficult case. And I'm sure, Faisal, you come across this quite a lot. And uh, Mohammed, in your ICU, you're dealing with this, um, the, the two we together. We actually face this situation especially motorbike accident. Uh, yeah. So if, if you see here, um, if the topic is emergency medicine. Now, this craniotomy and all these fixations happening in theater. So as an emergency physician in the emergency department, how much we can do and what we can do. So as I mentioned earlier, and Daryl mentioned actually, resuscitation of this other trauma, immobilization, early scan, early referral, and of course, we, if it's intracranial injury, we deal with intracranial injury. If it's other injuries, we deal with other injuries, but nothing we can do about, about the spine except immobilization. Or, uh, Faisbhai, do you have any other, what is your expectation from emergency department in a spinal injury patient? If you could just... Hello. Dr. Faisal, can you hear us? Okay, Dr. Linick, uh, may I arise uh, another issue uh, if it's relevant to the spinal injury that is a uh, case uh, from uh, hanging or partial hanging. So uh, sometimes we get got patient like uh, patient is unconscious, uh, due to hypoxemia and also patient having soft tissue injuries and spinal uh, injuries too. So uh, in, in that patients, is there any particular uh, measure you can take to avoid secondary injuries? Because this sort of patient need to be resuscitated uh, uh, or we have to deal against hypoxemia as well as, uh, as cord injury also. So is there any protocol or particular precaution we can take for this uh, hanging patient? So again, like we don't see that much hanging, but again, we just go for classic ATLS protocol. So first is A is A, if patient is hypoxic, we try to intubate the patient, we have to intubate the patient. Number two is again, I, will not, I could not actually add anything because whatever happened, hangman fracture, different fracture, whatever fracture happened, 
this is someone like you know Faiz Bhai and uh, uh, Tofik Bhai. They, they are the neurosurgeons are the people who just step in. But in the time being, we intubate the patient, immobilize the patient, get the scan done, and depending on intensive care. Sorry. <laughs> So, depending on the situation in emergency department, we cannot add anything on that. If you see, it's a closed structure. But of course, we will not apply the collar. And Daryl already mentioned that we have to use a CSF pressure and hanging the local soiling, local edema. We don't have much control. So, again, it's intensivist and emergency physicians do medical management. But if it's, a, it's the ideally, and the, what we actually do is proper ventilation strategy and our neuro, neuro, uh, neurosurgical intervention. So I don't know what is your settings there, but that, that, that we, we do here, but fortunately we didn't see any hanging that, you know, uh, in that state, uh, not actually, dead. But... Yeah, actually I'm working in a corporate hospital. So I have the facilities, uh, multidisciplinary colleagues like uh, neurosurgeon, spinal surgeon, trauma surgeon, so we have a protocol because we have a trauma team. Any patient having across any trauma history, so all the concern consultant is activated in a very short time. They assess their individual ways and put their opinions. And we are the critical care specialist, uh, uh, actually act as the captain of this uh, trauma team. So uh, another popular question uh, among our if, if, I just, if, if i if i just ask you here so of course any trauma team then and there within moment the trauma team is here which yes. is us we lead the trauma team and we are here chair yeah it or christian so as a team like who anyone can do any job so we are doing an art line we are doing a central line exactly, we're exactly. Doing patient and we're giving the patient fair enough but the question is we're talking about early resuscitation and investigation the second part is management and treatment yeah. now the definitive treatment is else is, is outside emergency department yeah definitely so, so um yes so every hospital and it's like similar like what you mentioned exactly another popular question the how long we uh, allow uh, cervical collar and heart surfaces because uh, it has some hazardous outcome too so what about your experience and recommendation? So I'll pass it to Faiz Bhai, but in emergency point of view, if the patient is allowing or came as a pre-hospital with collar, um, if we consider or suspected C-spine injury or any spinal injury, we did immediate scan and neurosurgeons, we have neurosurgery center in, in our hospital, major neurosurgical center. So we get the advice and whether they so we are not operating, move to Miami J collar or soft collar or without collar, we are um, just blocking it depending on the injury and depending on the neurosurgeon's input. So finally, would you mind to just uh, comment no, on that? It's again, you know, if the patient is intubated and sedated, though they need a collar because they are not moving their head. So, and, you measure, uh, you control your ICP in, in respect to the hanging or any RTA situation, or deal with other any abdominal or any other any other pathology. So when there is a fracture, again the, the gold standard is whether operate or not to operate. So that is the first decision you have to have to make, provided the patient is stable. If the patient is operated, then the fracture has been fixed, so he doesn't need per se any collar. Sometimes we put uh, collar in post op. But if we treat the patient non-operatively with a collar or a halo, halo is a different one for the halo, it again depend, depends on your age, your what type of a fracture, and every hospital has their own protocol. Normally, you know, when you see a pec fracture in elderly, so that has become, or a unilateral facet fracture in an undisplaced facet fracture might be a displaced also. So in those cases, in the elderly people, normally you keep CL X-ray, two weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, whether the fracture is healing or not. And after four to six weeks, you can do a flexion extension x-ray to see there's a movement or not. Even the fracture on the x-ray is not showing healing, it might have some fibrous union and, and it is not mobile. So it is it is very difficult and it's purely kind of, it depends on the clinician who's looking after the patient. But in an elderly, collar is also, a dangerous thing to do. So try to use that as less as possible. Yeah. Okay. Mm. 
If there any question from the uh, the candidates, I can just lots of participants here, but nobody's asking any question. Of course, we, we, we like questions, but any any thought, any other questions from from the candidates of Halimbe? Of course, Halimbe is most welcome if nobody's asking a question and they're most welcome to ask questions. But while we're waiting, if I could just come in, we're doing um so the big I think the big question worldwide uh and whether this is going to be adopted universally is whether we use C-spine collars or not. Now we've seen mm. in particularly the pediatric population, we're moving away from that because I don't know if any of you tried to put a collar on a two-year-old um, who's in pain, but uh, it ends up with a lot of thrashing and screaming and moving around, which makes the potential C-spine injury a bit of a problem. And the elderly, as we've said, with their you know, their uh, spinal stenosis or their osteophytes, um, which hold the spine in unusual positions, and then we try and straighten it into a collar is also dangerous. We, um, um, we have... You have muted yourself somehow, Dr. Wood. Uh, thanks. We... We've just started, we're participating in a study called the Spinal Immobilization Study. And it's going to be, it's probably the first large randomized controlled trial on whether we should use uh, cervical spine collars or not. And we've randomized the groups to one group will be just getting normal immobilization without collars. And the other group, and that would be just head blocks, probably, or whatever the paramedics feel. And then we're going to compare that to full C-spine collar and head blocks and triple immobilization. And the reason for the study is because there's a lot of sort of anxiety about using collars now. Um, I know in Scandinavia, it is not protocol, if I'm to be corrected to use cervical spine collars. I think Australia is also moving away from cervical spine collars. So we need to answer this question and it needs to be done soon because we need standardized practice, practice across the board. Um, uh, for the moment, I, the recommendation is to follow your local protocol wherever you are. We still use cervical spine collars and head blocks. That's what we do but I would like to see more evidence. Um, and we, when we're talking evidence, we would like to see a large multi-centered, ideally multinational randomized controlled trial um, and to get a definitive answer on this question. Another uh, technical things I have uh, observed that the size of the collar, because in the part of the uh, world, the neck size is a big issue. So if, if there is a uh, male size collar is placed, then uh, I think there is a chance of secondary injuries and other discomfort, pain, et cetera. Uh, my another question uh, regarding this uh, important measure to avoid secondary injuries, we use usually analgesics, adequate analgesics to relieve the patient. Sometimes some neurosurgeon or spinal surgeon suggest uh, steroid for uh, they said uh, they observe sometimes it's beneficial, but we know there is not any uh, clean cut evidence that steroid uh, reduces the morbidity and mortality. But what about your experience other than analgesic use uh, regarding therapeutic options for that particular patient? Let me answer that one again. And we all know about those big studies yes. done in America regarding methyl uh, in the spinal cord injury patient. So far, I know American still uses methyl prep, but in UK, we hardly ever, and in my training, I never use a methyl prep or any other steroids for a spinal cord injury. Okay. I mean, again, our neurosurgeons, I, I hardly been asked you give it. So I don't know, like, mm. you know, we normally no. just follow well patient, but we've never been asked to give one. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, it's individual as I think someone maybe recommend it. No, in UK, no one recommends it. It is not in the nice guideline to give metal yeah. prednisolone. We never give it. Yeah. So Dr. Halim, uh, like, do you have any protocol you follow? I mean, why you do that? Is it the national protocol or your hospital protocol or and how they've been made? Just just trying to curiosity. Uh, regarding steroid or? Uh, yes, steroid. 
the, actually we critical care physicians uh, don't want to use steroid routinely because it is very poor evidence or no evidence at all to uh, reduce morbidity and mortality. This decision very often comes from the surgical colleagues. This is my question uh, about this. Um, we are not convinced uh, that about use of steroids. Uh, sorry, uh, can I uh, supplement something? Yes, please. I'm Dr. Janu. So, no, uh, actually, uh, surgical colleagues are not uh, uh, adequately or frequently use uh, methylprednisolone in case of trauma. But our neurologist colleague actually uh, frequently use methylprednisolone in case of trauma and other uh, uh, cases. But uh, we actually follow the um, protocol of UK. Uh, uh, usually, we don't use uh, any uh, steroid, especially in case of uh, head injury and spine injury. So uh, we try to protocol. Uh, we try to follow uh, uh, the protocol from UK. At least uh, we try to uh, teach our junior. We try to follow one protocol. We uh, know there is <coughs> sorry no role in the use of uh, methylprednisolone in case of a spinal injury. But in our uh, uh, residency period uh, uh, at the, uh, near the 2000, uh, at that time uh, our teacher uh, usually used to use methylprednisolone or steroid in case of spine and head injury. But we are now follow the protocol of uh, UK. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Janu, sir. Uh, he is a professor of clinical neurosurgery from National Institute of Neurosciences and yes. Hospital. Thank you, sir, for your valuable opinions. Uh, I may invite our uh, learned panelists to highlight in, uh, today's, about today's topics. First of all, I want to ask uh, Dr. Kanish Fatima, Madam, regarding the challenges or issues, uh, differentiate and uh, resuscitate neurogenic shock, uh, dis other distributive shock and spinal shock. What are the challenges from a critical care physician's point of view? Uh, thank you, Dr. Robul, for asking this question. Uh, the presentation was, as usual, excellent, Dr. Luni. Uh, regarding uh, Dr. Uh, Daryl has already said that resuscitation is the most important part. And uh, when we get any patient with neurogenic shock, we usually at first we give fluid boluses. And after, still after giving fluid boluses, if the patient has hypotension, then we uh, usually start uh, vasopressor or inotropic agent. We usually use norepinephrine as the first choice, as first choice. If patient has due to neurogenic shock, we all know that patient have hypotension along with bradycardia. If patient has, uh, after getting norepinephrine, if patient has bradycardia, then sometimes we go for dopamine, dopamine infusion. Uh, bradycardia also respond with atropine injection or glycopyrrolate injection, which are available in our country. Then uh, usually patient usually respond with this norepinephrine dopamine. We do not have to go for epinephrine to start with. And uh, yes, there is important of importance of uh, distinguishing neurogenic shock with other shock, like patient with road traffic accident. They may have any lacerated injury, which have been uh, mixed with dart, and patient may vomit may develop aspiration pneumonia from there, they may have septic shock. We usually see the other parameters, whether the patient has temperature, what is his WBC count, what is the percentage of neutrophil. Seeing all this, we take decision uh, about that the patient has uh, neurogenic shock or patient have uh, septic shock or other shock. Hypovolemic shock usually comes first in, pace, uh, in cases of patient with uh, road traffic accident or polytrauma, especially if they have any injury in the chest. So hypovolemic shock always comes first. Then we think about neurogenic shock. And in neurogenic shock, we know that 
patient has hypotension along with bradycardia and uh, sometimes their skin are warm and flushed and sometimes this, this uh, skin is cold and clammy. So these are the important point to distinguish between neurogenic shock with other shock. That's all from my side. Thank you, madam, for your valuable comments and opinions. If I just add, so another extra advantage we have um, in our department or any department in UK that we have a machine called ultrasound machine. So after initial trauma, like if it's a no obvious other injuries or free fluids, so we can see the intravenous So we yes. can assess. We also use it. I just forgot to mention it. Please, this carry on. Yeah, please, uh, yeah. if you just continue. No, you, you carry on. It's not a problem. So, so we, we look yeah. at digestion fraction uh, and yes. how the heart function and how the intravenous cover. Depending on that, after adequate fluid resuscitation, what Dr. Kanas Fatima said, then move to that. But by this time, patient normally don't stay that long, that critical ill patient in emergency department. It may happen, but again, we do our metropolis with a multidisciplinary team. But this is something we, we, we very, very closely follow and use. Thanks. Okay. Another question to the, our panelist. How early we should put on patient on antithrombolytic therapy because patient is immobilized and there is a very high chance of deep vein thrombosis and other complications. So what are the you recommendation when to start or how quickly to start antithrombotic therapy and when to stop uh, before uh, surgery? But what will be the time duration to start uh, and stop? DVD prophylaxis and other things. Anyone? So, trauma patient yeah. normally. I don't know. This from Patty is five by. Do you have to come in? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Again, it, 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 it depends, you know. Uh, we're talking about a chemical prophylaxis, but mechanical prophylaxis should be started from the beginning. You know, yeah. once you come in, when the patient is stable, the yeah. photron uh, and the uh, stocking uh, should be there uh, mm -hmm. from, uh, from the beginning. By the time you decide whether the patient is for surgery or not, you know, in, in, and then if the patient is for surgical intervention, you don't start, patient goes for surgery, whatever form it is, and then, According to the protocol, we start uh, 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 chemical prophylaxis 24 or 48 hours after the initial surgery. If the patient is not for surgery, and if there's no specific contraindication, we should start chemical prophylaxis within 24 to 48 hours. And some of the centers even starts early, even for the day one, they start chemical, the chemical, uh, uh, chemical prophylaxis. Especially spinal cord injury, who is not for like a central cord syndrome. Just an example, you know, we, if you decide patient not for surgery, uh, you want to wait for 48 hours to recover the cord, the chemical prophylaxis should be started from the day, day one. And again, it depends on what form of chemical prophylaxis you provide, like an anoxyparin and deltaparin, which has been commonly used in UK. It should be stopped at least eight to 12 hours prior to the, prior to the surgery. So you omit that dose on the night before normally. Okay, so if any uh, any other, uh, no contraindication, so we should use uh, sequential uh, compression stockings immediately, and after within uh, twenty four to forty eight hours, we should uh, put on patient on chemical prophylaxis. If I don't, even no if, if, even if, yeah, even even from the day one, you know, even yeah. from the day one, the risk of DVT is quite high in the Caucasian exactly. population. You know, from from the subcontinent one. Whether we don't know, and there's no study, the rate of DVTs in, 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 in back home. But here we should start as from the day one, to be honest. All the spinal cord injury unit have the local protocol, and they will advise that start uh, chemical prophylaxis if there's no other contraindication. Another question is any patient having a spinal injury or patient having multiple trauma or also clinical examination suggests that this patient having uh, neurogenic shock also. So uh, the uh, nutritional support or when to use enteral feeding is the another question. Is there any recommendation from surgical point of view the how long we have to wait or keep stomach empty or put on parental therapy or how early we can initiate the enteral therapy? 
No, no, no. Again, you know, these are the emergency surgery. Whether you had a food before the RTA or don't have the food before the RTA, it, it doesn't matter. The anesthetics are pretty good here and they will intubate. And there's always a chance of uh, uh, aspiration. But this, all these are life-saving and link-saving procedures. So the, the chance of aspiration has to be, has to be taken. And parent, parental nutrition, I will not go into details. It is quite a long-term scenario. So by that time, the patient should be judged by the anesthetic or the, uh, or the ITU doctor. And they make the decision, not the surgical point of view, to be honest. Okay, I think it is beyond emergency department. Uh, it's uh, the routine mm -hmm. care of the critical care setup. For yeah, yeah. Setup. Okay. Uh, I'd like to add something, Dr. Robul. Please, ma'am. Uh, regarding the nutrition, usually uh, if, uh, we put on the NG tube, examine the stomach, do an ultrasound. If there is no uh, blood coming through the NG tube, uh, no, or we check the suction and do the occult blood test. And if the ultrasound reveals there is no abnormality, gross abnormality in the abdomen, we also do clinical examination. Then we usually start feeding. Thank you, ma'am. Any? I think Dr. Derek has something to say. He has uh, raised his you. hand. Um, just on the question of um, DVT prophylaxis in in an undifferentiated trauma patient, naturally we're not going to give any anticoagulants early. In fact, we standard protocol, I don't know if you use it in Bangladesh, is we use tranexamic acid within three hours of any major trauma or any uh, significant traumatic brain injury. There's definite benefits shown in the moderate uh, to mild brain injury group with regards to tranexamic acid. And certainly in major trauma, if given earlier. In fact, the, every um, 20 minutes you delay the tranexamic acid, you increase the risk of mortality up to 10% in the, that specific ca category. The bonus, one thing out of all the CRASH-4 studies where this, this data comes from is that if you're looking at um, you know, risk of thrombosis is the uh, tranexamic acid does not increase increase the risk of DVTs or thrombotic events uh, post uh, trauma or traumatic brain injuries. Um, so I would encourage our audience to go and read all the crash studies. There's crash one, two, and three. We're busy with crash four at the moment. There's also another study with tranexamic, tranexamic acid that's just come out called Patch Trauma from Australia. These are all excellent and they're really pertinent to what we can do in the emergency uh, scenario early on. But uh, uh, Dr. Hassan, Faisal Hassan has already alluded to when to use um, anticoagulants if there's an isolated spinal cord injury. In that case, yes, obviously we're going to try and protect the patient from DVTs, which Mohammed, you've said is high risk in these patients, particularly when they're immobilized. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Darrell, we, we have a protocol that early use of tranexamic acid and it is available. We commonly use it because almost 25 to 30 percent of our ICU bed is occupied by the trauma patient. So we have very good experience regarding tranexamic acid and guideline also suggests that tranexamic acid reduces the bleeding chance and also uh, some benefits. So it is our usual practice to use tranexamic acid. So uh, any audience, any questions, we are almost end of the session. Uh, so I think our all the uh, LANET panelists uh, actively participate throughout the uh, presentation till now. Uh, if any of you want to say any message regarding today's topics or any comments regarding today's presentation, it will be highly uh, appreciated. I'll just one. If I may, because the concept. Oh, yes, please. No, no, please, please. Yeah, you carry on. So, so thank you. So, the concept of um, emergency department or emergency medicine is not in, in different minds is different in Bangladesh. So, any major trauma patient or suspected spinal trauma patient, or we found out that is a trauma this patient stays in emergency department minutes to an hour. 
because they go to the either definitive pathway to theater under neurosurgeons, if it's, of course, is a spinal tumor we're talking about, or going to ITU for uh, other managements. So, because in Bangladesh, emergency and IT when we mix together and the questions come because we never ever, I don't even know what the parental feeding, I mean, none of the emergency medicine specialists know what is actually involved and include. Um, we, we did it as a part of our training and different specialty, but emergency medicine is, we are dealing with undifferentiated patient, medical team or surgical, and we are stabilizing that and finding a diagnosis and putting it to, to the right definitive treatment. So this is the emergency medicine, but of course, ITU have different role, uh, pre or post surgery or without surgery. So that's what I'm going to mention. Thank you. Uh, Again, the, I also want to highlight one point regarding a spinal, spinal trauma. So be aware of the angst spawn patient. So though, again, during my training, we don't know much about angst spawn, you know, but again, just be aware of all the junior doctors. You will do more harm than good if you try to realign or you know, try to follow the protocol in a patient with angst spawn uh, disease. Thank you, uh, Dr. Farooq, sir. Uh, now I'm at the end of the session. I invite Dr. Derelut to make a concluding remark regarding today's presentation. Thank you, Mohamed. This has been an excellent opportunity for us to talk about emergency management of spinal cord injury, and we've got quite esteemed panelists, so it's been a privilege. Um, just take home for me is always focus on adequate resuscitation of your patients. Um, the spinal cord injury is commonly missed in the early phase. Um, so when you have um, unusual uh, responses to your um, resuscitation, such as a bradycardia or a persistent hypotension when there's no obvious uh, hemorrhage or hypovolemic shock, just be aware there might be a spinal cord injury. Um, and, you know, immobilizing this, the spine appropriately, that does not mean um, forcing C-spines into collars, but it's, it's appropriate immobilization for that patient. Um, be careful when uh, moving these patients to CT scans or to theaters that already have an existing spinal cord uh, injury. You will immobilize them as you move them across because often during movement, there's a risk of um, uh, worsening the spinal cord injury. But good luck in the front line. It's tough out there. And um, I, uh, you know, I think it's uh, identifying these injuries is not difficult. I mean, not easy. Thank you, Dr. Daryl and all the uh, panelists. And last of all, not least, Dr. Linick for your beautiful presentation. We all enjoying this session and uh, good night. See you again. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.